off by giving you a little bit of a backstory. It won't take uh, too long about sort of how I ended up here because it might help explain a little bit about some of the rules I'd like to share with you about how to succeed at multinational cyber engagements. All right, so if we go back in time. I grew up in New Jersey. I grew up about uh, 20 minutes from New York City, right outside of uh, Manhattan. So it was an easy bus ride or train ride into the city. My parents were both uh, teachers. And uh, even better than that, they were both science teachers. So my house was largely about exploration and unbounded learning. So I was uh, pretty lucky to have the ability to pretty much break anything in my house without getting into, into too much trouble. And so I'd say uh, around the year 1981, I launched a full-on information uh, campaign in order to be able to persuade my parents to buy me an Apple computer. And I was like super excited about the idea of having a computer and I had seen computers and there were a few uh, uh, Radio Shack computers in the schools, but I really, really wanted my own. And it took me about a year or two to convince my parents to make this gigantic investment of 2,000 US dollars at the time to buying me a computer. And uh, finally, I think uh, one day I just walked into my bedroom and there was sitting a, uh, an Apple IIe computer with two floppy disks and a monochrome screen. And, and I, I was pretty excited, right? Because I could finally now spend every waking moment of my day when I was not in school programming. Right, which I think maybe some people in the room might appreciate the joy of being able to, able to do that. And so that combined with a, a local um, sort of Radio Shack type store led me to a lot of good adventures where I would go buy lots of things to put together and not realize how they should go together because who reads instructions or, or manuals how to do anything? And I would take things like wires that certainly couldn't handle the capacity of the power I wanted to put through them, and I hooked them up to batteries, and sure enough, I would end up lighting my mother's car on fire one day because I just didn't understand how power, electricity, and these things worked. But that's sort of the mind of a hacker, right? It's being able to sort of explore our environment, learn from our mistakes, and become a little bit better about how we uh, do things. So flash forward a few more years, I end up at uh, Boston College, which is a nice Jesuit university. Uh, right outside of uh, Boston, Massachusetts. About three months before graduation, I foolishly get caught breaking into the computer systems there, and thankfully, because it's a Jesuit university, they believed more in forgiveness than uh, expelling me. So I was forced to write system security guides and perform community service and do all sorts of things that they make you do when they think you did something terribly wrong, even though it wasn't really that wrong. And so. By 1998, about five years post-graduation, I finally find my way to the MITRE Corporation. And then the MITRE Corporation is this federally funded research and development center. It's a kind of a cool type of organization where you essentially do all of your work for the US government. And so I had this pretty cool boss. I, she hired me into her group, which was the Information Warfare and Secure Systems Engineering Group. So that's a pretty cool you know, name of, an, of a group to join. I had a pretty cool boss. And she, what she did is she took me and she split me up into sort of two types of projects, right? And so the one type of project was mostly working for this organization that was in Texas at the time. It was called the Air Force Information Warfare Center. And essentially what would happen is this, this guy would show up and every couple months, he would show up with a bunch of like things he needed, right? So things he was interested in sort of learning about. And those things would be like, hey, you know, could you like just take a look at the promiscuous mode on a network card and tell me like how that works and what do you know about that? Or could you tell me about how on a network, how the ARP cache works? Or could you just look at this routing protocol and tell me everything you know about it to each of the different versions of the protocol. And so it was very much technical analysis on behalf of a customer who was interested in doing whatever they were interested in doing with this information. And so these are pretty good tasks, right? Because they allow you to spend a lot of time looking at something in a very, very narrow way. And you get to learn every little sort of nook and cranny of that particular protocol, right? And some of the things that you end up finding out are, well, 
you know, there are these protocols that were implemented by some very, very thoughtful engineers, but then you have actually programmers who actually implemented the protocol in device drivers or put them into some sort of firmware layer in order to actually make them work on the device. And sure enough, you know, they would induce into these particular drivers and firmware updates and essentially vulnerabilities that were not necessarily meant to be there, but it's, you know, it's, it's not as easy as you might think to implement a protocol, right, in order to be able to make it work as secure as it is supposed to work. And so, you know, on the one hand, I spent all this time sort of thinking about, you know, how to muck with people's things, right? And the other side, uh, I sort of ended up in this situation where my boss would send me out into the field, and that's the other thing that sort of a lot of MITRE engineers do is you end up supporting operational programs, right? And so she sent me off to work with different armed force uh, organizations to help them look at their operational systems, right? And so we'd go out into the field and you'd have this, you know, sort of Humvee and the Humvee would have all of these digital support systems, the digital support systems would have all of these functions and you would just sit there and perform an analysis of all the different systems uh, were part of the military platform and then you would talk to the officer and say, well, you know, the officer in charge of the platform and say, here's what this system essentially does, here are the things I found, here are the things we can mitigate or remediate, and here is the risk you're going to have to accept to operate this device outside in the field, right? So this sort of idea of risk assessment and certification and accreditation. And so it sort of was a nice, you know, couple years of like sort of my first, you know, I guess, government I cyber job, right? So half of it was like very offense related and half of it was very much defense related and trying to understand both perspectives of how these two worlds come together. And so, you know, a few years later, I get a little bored and tired because I'm 20, you know, late 20s and I want to try something new, so I leave MITRE for, for a few years, and I, I end up working for a nanotechnology company, but then, you know, I get a little antsy to come back and sort of contribute again to this pretty cool and, uh, organization and the customers that they're supporting, and so I end up back at MITRE, and I end up in this information op, uh, international uh, operations organization, right? So this was uh, an office at Hanscom Air Force Base, and this was the Air Force's international projection uh, to support what we call foreign military sales cases and security assistance cases. And so, in this case, country X would call up the U.S. and say, hey, we need some help with something. And the U.S. would say, okay, we can help you with that. And they would transfer some money, and then the, you know, the U.S. government would send us over to that country in order to be able to help them do whatever they needed to to do. And, and so my first engagement, and this is where I guess the, the things I've learned through these international engagements was now I've been sort of working internationally for uh, 11 years and uh, spent about four, four, months a year, four months of each year away abroad supporting different, uh, different customers. And so my first engagement was with the government of Japan and with the Japan Air Self-Defense Force, right? And so it was sort of a, a, a pretty straightforward task, an engineering task really, which was support their missile defense function, help them do some modeling of missile, uh, missiles incoming to Japan and help them understand how they can essentially launch their missiles in time in order to intercept the missile that's incoming, yada, yada. So it's not just more or less a, a MATLAB modeling job, right? And so I do all this work and then they would essentially send me over to Tokyo every couple months in order to be able to brief the customer. But I was always really interested in being able to find out more and more things about what's going on in the countries I was working in. And so I would reach out ahead of time to people I was interested in talking to. And so one of the other sort of side projects I had I was working was this, at the time it was a classified counter unmanned systems program, which was essentially this program to find things in the sky and then be able to negate them, right? To get rid of them because no one likes bad things flying at your sensitive objects, right? And so I reached out to this organization called JAXA, which is the, essentially the Japan version of NASA and they're responsible for unmanned systems. And I said, you know, I found the person who was responsible for unmanned systems at JAXA, I sent him an email and I said, hey, can I meet with you next time I'm in Japan? And he's like, sure, right? You know, I get an email back, you know, happy to have you, right? So we go to Japan, we do our briefings for the customer on the work we're there. Then, you know, we get into the 
subway, drive through the subway across town, you know, end up out of the subway, get into a taxi, get into the taxi, take it over to JAXA, and then we have this meeting, just me and one of the guys from the J Japan office who can perform the translation for me. And like, you know, we go in, we have some tea together, and like halfway through the meeting, you know, he's conversing with my colleague in Japanese, and you know, my colleague says to me, you know, Chris, you know, he, he's, he, he appreciates that you're here, but he doesn't really have any idea why you're here. And I go, oh, that's sort of interesting, right? Like, he doesn't just want to share with me just because, you know, that's what we do. And he's like, no, that's not really a cultural thing they do here. Like, you're, he's like sort of being polite hosting you, but, uh, you know, he doesn't really understand what's up, why you're here. I'm like, huh, I, I guess maybe I didn't really think through this too much. Maybe I should have thought a little bit more about how he would perceive my, you know, appearing on his doorstep asking all these questions. I'm like, all right, so I put that into my, my mental bank of things that are interesting to know about, right? And so then the other thing I would do to a lot of the countries I would visit, and this again back in the, the late 2000s, is I would find the local CERT team in that country, and I'd look them up and I'd reach out ahead of time and say, hey, you know, we're doing this cyber work and I would be interested in, in, in talking with you about what you're doing at the, the CERT in your country. And again, same thing, I find the local contact in Japan, we set up a meeting, and then we go for this meeting. And this is sort of one of these like seminal moments, right, in, the, in, the, in my career where I was like, we're sitting in the room, and again, you know, across this side of the table is the Americans, and across that side of the table are the, the Japanese CERT guys, and there's this guy, Misato-san, right? And he has been around the CERT community, the first community for forever. So if you ever attend any of the first conferences, like you would know Misato, he's sort of a legend in the CERT community. And we're talking about concepts, about you know, terminology. And I said to him, I was like, you know, when I say to you information sharing, what does that mean to you? What, is that, what do you mean by information sharing? And he's like, well, Chris, you know, information sharing means you give information to me. And I go, oh, wait a second. I go, that does not imply any sort of reciprocity. So if I set up an information sharing relationship with you, you're not going to give me anything back. He goes, well, I might, but no. I mean, what you've essentially asked me for is simply to allow you to share information with me. And I go, oh, all right, that's sort of good to know. So what, what should I do? Like, how should I phrase this with you? And he goes, oh, what you want to ask for is an information exchange agreement. And information exchange to us means that I give you information, you give me information, we have this relationship where now, you know, we're doing your version of sharing, right? And I'm like, huh, that's sort of interesting, right? Because now, like, you know, I hadn't really thought of that. So now, when I ever I meet with my international customers, ever since then, I always use the term information exchange, which really does seem to translate pretty well across language and culture. People understand the idea of an exchange, which is a little different than this idea of, of sharing. And so rule number one, which I ended up coming up with, was create a normalized vocabulary for cyber terminology, right? Because we need to do a pretty good job of being able to deconflict you know, essentially, what do we mean by the terms that we're talking about, right? And so what this ended up creating was two different work programs. And the first one I'll bring up, which I think is kind of nifty, and I think that, you know, we, you've probably heard a little bit about this this week from some of the different presentations, was we ended up doing a lot of what we call the intersection of foreign language and cyber analysis, right? So in this case, we wanted to understand how other communities operating in the cyber domain, you were communicating, relating with each other, what the social structures look like. And so we did some analysis of cyber crime forums, if you will. And so here is just a picture. This is back from the, again, the mid to early 2000s. So this is a profile of someone named, named Smooch. And you know, as you can see right here, you know, there's some information about them, the founder and administrator. So they have some sort of status in this community so we can look through that and figure that out. You know, when we go down to here and we see a posting about, well, you know, how good is, how is a good reputation and uh, weight accrued in this community, right? How do I become a elevated member of this community? And these communities were, were carding communities. So these are the people who steal credit card numbers, go out and put them onto the physical plastic, send out people all over the world to actually go put the plastic into the ATMs and then steal lots of money within like, you know, 30 minutes, millions of dollars get transferred out. So this is the type of communities that we were analyzing in this. And so 
as you can see here, we have a registration date, number of messages and status, and so from here we can determine, you know, this sort of person's reputation within the community, which is sort of nifty to see. And then we see, well, your level of activity will promote the enhancement of your application, of your reputation. So the more you contribute, the more you'll receive back from the community, which is sort of nifty to know, right? And so then we have this sort of like game theory approach to figuring out, you know, what makes someone most successful, and, and really the end result ends up being, the more that you share, the more that you exchange with others, the more that you end up receiving back from the community, right? Which sort of makes a lot of sense, except that in a community which is largely built around crime, about criminal activity, you know, exchanging information isn't always the most sort of comfortable or common thing. Essentially, you know, you're giving up all this information about these illegal activities or actions that you're taking. And so, we see through here these different forum posts come up, which essentially were now brokers in the community, which would help out with verifying people within the different carding communities. So a verified RU, people deserve our trust, you know, uh, this uh, our arbit arbitration service. So let's say you uh, gave someone some information or gave them some card information. They in turn did not give you back the money that you asked for, and all of a sudden, you know, you want to be able to arbitrate that dispute, and so there are arbitrators who would help you with that. And finally, some blacklists for people who you should never deal with. So these were things that we found through the analyzing the communities, right? And so, and then a blacklist. So these are some sort of interesting things here where now you have people, you know, sort of you know, vetting people into the community, you know, oh, you know, you are, uh, I'm Scammer891, your friend referred me, oh, I'm Boris565 from Fraudster, you know, we have people who can vouch for each other, so now we can do our cyber business together. But essentially what we encountered through this analysis is sort of a couple things. First thing was, we were analyzing this forum data, but what we were also analyzing at the time was a collection of what we'll I'll just say were instant messages that were being sent between forum members. Uh, so it turns out that someone who was a, sort of a central figure in one of the criminal organizations didn't do a very good job of sanitizing their computer before it was taken, uh, taken over by a law enforcement agency and summarily passed to us for analysis. And so in this case, we now are looking not only through forum posts, but we're also looking through this idea of you know, what we call computer-mediated communication, so text messages and instant messages and so forth. And so we found a lot of like, issues with the information that we were analyzing, where these misspellings, uh, you know, length of messages were shortened, and therefore there was some compression of the words and so forth. And so what we ended up with was this this idea of these orthographic variations. And you know, for the Russian speakers in the room, they'll, they'll have the most appreciation for this particular chart right here. So the first thing we found were these things called transliterations, right? And so those essentially are when you take a foreign character and replace it with the, uh, the I would just, we'll call the English character uh, you know, equivalent, if you will. So we saw lots of these transliterations, and so when we were looking through the different messages, we found like 11 different ways they spelled you know, Windows, uh, 10 for Slackware, 9 for Firefox, and so forth. But I think that the more interesting ones are sort of these ones over here, which we had to do a little bit of work to figure out what, what, what exactly are they trying for here. So the first one's simply just representation of uh, pronunciation, as you can see here. And so on the left-hand side, you can see the form Russian, the center is this computer-mediated uh, communication Russian, and then the translation's on the right here. So you can see that the formal Russian is this Aftor, but the CMC was Aftar. And so what they would do is they would take how you actually say the word and use that within the actual like, text or instant message that they would be sending back and forth between each other, right? So that's sort of, sort of nifty. But the abbreviations are, are pretty cool too, right? And so all of you in the room here, you probably send text messages. If you were to send a text message and you put NP, the letters NP into a message, what does it mean? No problem, right? So if you're reading through this, you know, Russian text messages and you see an MP, you're like, oh, that must mean no problem, right? But it turns out it doesn't mean no problem because it means not premier or for example, right? And so these are the types of things we had started to kind of pick up on. It's like, oh, like, so they're taking this and they're doing substitution. And so when you look at something like this character right here, right, this looks like a number four, right? But the number four, you know, is, uh, 
is pronounced the ch, right? A little differently, uh, the character when you look at it differently. So then you end up with this substitution that they put in here. And finally, it's the same thing here. So if you were to see like V7 in a text message, right? You might say, oh, they must be talking about like version seven of some sort of software or program, whatever it might be. But it turns out seven ends up being CM, which ends up being a shortened version of to everyone here. And then again, this character appears again in evening. And as you can see here, this, uh, this B looking character is actually pronounced in Russian as a V sound. So what we would do is we would see the V replaced by the B and then the seven with the sim. And so you see these kind of substitutions take place. And then actually, I guess the, the one I get the most questions on is like what's going on down here. And that's simply, you know, cool hackers trying to use like English, you know, Latin characters to represent Cyrillic characters, right? So it's kind of cool to, instead of having like this Cyrillic character here, you would just use the curly brackets right there and it'd be like, I'm a cool hacker. Right, because that's what cool hackers do. And so these are the types of information we would find in all of these sort of um, things that we were analyzing. And then finally, there's this idea of, of sort of so neologisms, right? Those are just words that are acquired into a vocabulary. So words that didn't exist, but that now do exist, right? So in the 2000s, we have words like Google and Mozilla you know, PayPal. So these are things that would appear in the vocabularies, and then we'd see the sort of the Russian equivalents that they came up with in their computer-mediated communication to how to represent those particular words. And then finally, uh, word affixations here. So we're gonna borrow words from different languages and then put them together in order to create these new types of words. And so this was one part of the, the work program that was sort of spurred out of this sort of idea of, hey, like, you know, you know, foreign language and cyber and the intersection is a pretty big deal, how we sort of put these terms together. Now, the other side of it is that around 2011, 2012, I get sent over to a Baltic nation, and we had been helping this Baltic nation for a long time with data link support. So essentially, how to integrate fighter jets together to make sure that they can fly in these uh, sort of multinational consortium efforts, if you will. So if you have a NATO effort and a bunch of countries come together to support a NATO operation, you want to be able to make sure those jets can communicate with each other. That was the core of the program. But then they said, hey, you know, what about cyber? We would like your help on cyber. And so the, the default you know, reaction was always in my organization was show them the technical stuff. And I was always like, well, you know, we've been doing this for like 30 years and they've been doing this for like three months. Like they're not gonna really appreciate a lot of the things that we wanna share with them. Why don't we start and just talk to them about vocabulary at first? That's probably a pretty good idea, right? We can just sort of share with them some ideas about, you know, what these words mean, how should we use them, how do we communicate with you, what are the boundaries of the words? And so we created a couple tools. One was this tool called the International Cyber Vocabulary, which was this visualization of uh, European Union cyber terms aligned to US military cyber term concepts. The other thing we created was something called Flexicon, which is in this open source tool. And what Flexicon was essentially was is kind of like this, but Urban Dictionary. So, I mean, I, most of you have probably used Urban Dictionary at some point, right? So in Urban Dictionary, there's an idea, there's a word. And then inside of the Urban Dictionary context, you have the word being used in various contexts. So you can say, well, I use the word this way or the term this way, you use the word that way. So we just created this flexicon so that multinational teams who are working together could take these terms that they both sort of were using and put their different definitions into the database in order to be able to extract out these, these different meanings and everyone can make sure that they weren't going to be saying something that they shouldn't be saying. And so that was another example of the language issue. And so and I, I would encounter this, you know, sort of in every international engagement. So I was down in Bahrain, and the officer there said to me, hey, you know, we want to conduct offensive cyber attacks in order to collect intelligence information. And I go, listen, man, you can't talk that way. Like, people are going to, like, you know, throw you out of the room. I go, what you really are trying to do is something called computer network exploitation, which is the U.S. military term, essentially, for collecting intelligence, right, espionage. And espionage is allowable under international law, so there's sort of no issue with a country performing espionage. So you can go compromise the U.S.'s OPM database. Just don't steal the intellectual property, right? That's sort of how that uh, plays out. And so you'd have that example. And then finally, I guess one more example I would say was, you know, 
know, so I spent a lot of my time at the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is part of the United Nations, and the idea of the IAEA is to bring partner nations together to work on common uh, projects, right? And so my very first project with the IAEA back when I was uh, put there, 30% uh, like of my time working for the State Department was to help with developing a, a computer security incident response plan, right, in order for, for nuclear facilities. And in the room we had people, and I remember that very first consultancy, people in the room from you know, Turkey, from India, and from uh, Slovenia, and from, uh, let's see, Hungary, and then finally, I had a few more, but Japan was there as well, right? Japan seems to circle around to these stories uh, quite frequently. And so we were talk talking about this term sabotage, right? And sabotage is a, is a sort of a nuclear term, you know, specific nuclear term. It's also obviously a term that we use in the, in the cyber domain. But we went around the room saying, you know, what does sabotage mean to you, right? And, you know, people are like, oh, it's like when someone comes into your organization and tries to do something to a piece of hardware or software, something that you own, and it ends up, you know, just failing, right? And we get to the Japanese guys, and they're like, oh, no, no, no. Sabotage is when you take a truck and you drive it through the gates. And we're like, huh, like, I mean, are, is that, are you sure? Like, is that, like, is that what you, are we like not sort of explain this the right way? And we, so we go around a couple times and they were very, very insistent that sabotage was like, that's what it meant to them. And I was like, all right, that, that's cool with me. We're just gonna make sure that everyone in the room is clear that when we use the word sabotage, we should make sure that we're, you know, we're talking to the Japanese guys, we use it in one way, if we talk to everyone else, we're using it another way, we just need to make sure we put this all together. And so, you know, that sort of brought me to this idea of figuring out, you know, how, does, how do the people you're working with perceive the world, right? And, and that's sort of why I share a little bit of my background with you, because I want you to understand, you know, how I grew up, you know, how I learned, what, what makes me tick. And so when I work with a lot of these countries, you know, rule number two, anyone I'm working with, I'm trying to figure out, like, what was their experience growing up? You know, what was school like for them? What was their first job like? What, was, what is it about, like, you know, how they exist that is sort of interesting, to, things interesting to know about them, right? And so, you know, we would spend a lot of time, I spent a lot of time, but sort of just getting to know the people I was working with. But one of the things I did with this Baltic Navy on the first engagement was I, I, I put onto the agenda like a two-hour block of time to talk about international cyber norms, right? So this is just like norms of behavior. These aren't things that we all sort of agree upon, but these are things that when we talk about them allow us to gain a good amount of insight into how do you think about the world we live in. Right? And so we bring up these types of rules. So we can bring up the rule of like the responsibility rule. That's a pretty good rule, which is the, the fact that a cyber attack has been launched from an information system located in the state's territory is evidence that the act is attributable to that state. Right? Now, everyone reading that is going to say, that's crazy. Right? Like someone in Canada is going to be like, oh, like if the information system is in Canada, we're responsible for this cyber attack? Like, no one's gonna agree upon that. But when you talk about these types of rules, you got to kind of figure out, like, you know, well, well, how, where do you stand on this? Like, do you, do you believe this is a good idea, just not implementable? Do you think this is a bad idea because that's not something that you would ever do? I'm not sure. And like, so the cooperation room is another probably a pretty good rule to talk about, which is the fact that a cyber attack has been conducted via information systems, because its territory creates a duty to cooperate with the victim state. Right? And so that way, you know, if you have a cyber attack launched against you, you reach out to country X and say, hey, you know, I want your help, you know, because I have the cyber attack, that country should say to you, oh, I'm happy to help you, right? That's sort of the, the cooperation rule. So we have these rules, and, and this turns out to be a pretty good way in order to figure out, you know, and get people talking a little bit about, you know, their background, their norms, what they believe in, what they sort of don't believe in, and then these help you and helped us better understand how we could help them structure cyber defense capabilities, right? Because one of the things that we needed to sort of know from them was, you know, what do you really want to accomplish with your cyber defense goal? I mean, what are you trying to do here? Are you just trying to protect your systems? Do you want some sort of ability to be able to reach out and touch someone? Like really, what are you trying to, what, what's, your, what's your worldview? And so 
based upon our conversations on this and based upon a lot of the technical work we did, you know, um, this is actually, this actually was written by someone, and her name, her name is Anakin Tick. She's an Estonian lawyer who's also a cyber uh, expert. And, and, and so Anakin actually uh, and I worked together to help this country write their first sort of cyber operations guide, uh, legal guide. So what it was allowable, what's not allowable for them based upon the international rules of international law. And that has to do with these questions of like things like LOAC, right? The law of armed conflict and how cyber attacks affect LOAC and so forth. So sort of a, a nifty way to be able to meld together the technology, the policy, and the law. So that way the country felt like they had a path forward in order to be able to accomplish their, their cyber goals. All right, so that, I think that leads right to the next rule, which was, you know, building trust takes time and, and social engagement. So here are the things that I've done with my, 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 I guess, colleagues, my customers, right? And so certainly, you know, karaoke is, uh, is a, nice, a very nice team building activity. We all love to sing together, even if we're not very good singers. If you're in Korea, you know, you have enough sake bombs and, you know, it doesn't really matter how good or bad of a singer you are, you're just all happy to be together singing, right? You know, certainly sushi is good. Saunas, the, the, what's up with the Baltic states and the saunas? Everyone wants to constantly get naked with you. Right? It's like, oh, long day of work. Why don't you come have a beer with me and then we'll get naked together? Which is like, all right, that's sort of an odd thing, but we'll see how that goes. And finally, you know, death metal. So when I was working in this one country, I was introduced to the death metal culture, right? And as it was explained to me, like, you know, it's so dark here all year long. You have a question or? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I think the Finns have both the highest uh, population of both uh, death metal bands as well as saunas per person. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So you know, it's sort of a, but you know, it's it's sort of it's a great way to understand, you know, like how did the, how does this country think, right? So they're in the dark, you know, like seven months a year, right? It's like I mean, truthfully, you know, 10 a.m., you know, sun's rising. 2 p.m., sun setting, and, it's, you know, my f colleague would always say, Chris, you have to come to these concerts. It's a good way to release your, your energy, and it makes you feel good. And, and sure enough, I would go to these, like, death metal concerts, and it was, it was super fun. I think, actually, that picture right there is from uh, a band. Uh, this, this, this will, unfortunately, probably give it away, but Sabaton, which is a, sort of a nationalistic band in this country, which is a great band, and it's fun to go to the concert, and everyone there is chanting the... The, the national anthems and things. It's very, very fun. So these are the things that you know, we do in order to be able to create these relationships. And of course, it takes a lot of time. And so the one thing we know about cyber, which is maybe a little bit different than everything else, is simply that you know, revealing cyber vulnerabilities is a bit like you know, really exposing yourself to everybody, right? Like it's very, very, very uncomfortable for people to share with others how they've been compromised in the past, right? Or how they've been compromised recently. And I have like, I guess two specific cases which you know, really you know, were meaningful to me. And one again was, you know, I was in the basement of uh, the, one of these buildings in Ichigaya, which is the Japan Ministry of Defense is. And you know, I had met with this Japanese officer for like three years, right? Like, on this one project. And every time I'm there, like I am just a sharer, like information exchanger. I take whatever I know and I sh it's love spreading love, right? And for years he gave me nothing, <laughs> right? And finally one day he's like, Chris, I have a problem. And I'm like, oh, really? And he had like a full like 11 page printout of this intrusion that they had into their facility. And he is like, can you help us? And I'm like, totally, like that's what I've been waiting for, like for all these years. But it took like three years for you to get to the point, for you to trust me enough to sort of help you in this, in, in this moment, right? And so I was like, that, that's sort of a, a very sort of meaningful, okay. <laughs> okay, that's sort of a very, very meaningful thing to say. So build this relationship over time. And then from that, you know, kind of move forward. So the other point I'd make is that, you know, it's very easy to sell someone a product. It's not so easy to help them develop the capability. And so we spend a ton of time with customers simply helping them understand capability development. And so this is one of the biggest problems I would say that exists is that, so here, this is just 
amount of money being spent by countries on like military defense, right? Defense, uh, pro defense and intelligence projects, right? And so when you look at these numbers, right? That's like a, and this, this is from like early, early 2010 uh, timeframe. That's a gigantic number, like a ton of money, right? Here's the percentage by country, right? So in Russia and then, um, uh, so China, Russia, France, uh, United Kingdom, Japan, Sweden, and then Bahrain, who I was spending a lot of time with them at the time. Um, so country shows up and says, we want your help. U.S. vendor shows up and says, oh, sure, no problem. You know, here's, your, here's how we can sell this to you. Here are the 400 people you're going to need to implement it. Here is how, it's just overwhelming to them to be able to be able to implement a capability that the U.S. does with 40 people, and they have like one person. And in the nuclear world I work in right now, it's even a, a sort of a more significant problem where the number of, you know, cybersecurity engineers that exist at nuclear power plants and research reactors are usually like less than five and usually more like two or one, right? So having to help them implement any capability is sort of a, a big task, if you will. But that's what we spend a lot of time on. And then sort of the first thing that I like to talk to people about is this sort of how to acquire capabilities. And I teach them a little about like hacker mentality, right? So trying to understand, you know, how the adversary that you're trying to defend against Things, right? And so this is from um, this personality characteristics of hacker uh, presentation I found. And so, so personality characteristics of hackers, right? So first thing, feel free to raise your hand to self-identify high intelligence. Who here is high intelligence? Now you're all probably saying, all right, you know, I th I'm pretty sure I'm high intelligence. <laughs> Right? I mean, no one wants to raise their hand. That's fine. But you know, high intelligence you know, is something that we sort of identify as hacker mentality, right? Consuming curiosity. If you're a hacker you know, and you can't solve a problem, what do you end up doing? You end up like, not sleeping for months trying to solve the stupid problem. Right? It just like, bugs you to no end that this problem is sitting there and you can't figure it out. Right? So there's this consuming curiosity to find and like, solve the problems. Comfortable intellectual extractions. Stimulated by and appreciate novelty. Now, this part I always get a little trouble in because, you know, whenever I have been looking at attacks, even against my infrastructure over time, I don't take it personally. I am just fascinated by the cleverness that some attackers have used in order to be able to make their way into my environment. Like, I'm allowed to appreciate the novelty and beauty of someone spending months to years of their life infiltrating my infrastructure. It's kind of cool, right? It doesn't mean that's a great outcome, right? Because I still have a lot of work to do now. But you know, there's some novelty to, to, to it, right? And uh, individualistic, anti-conformist, I, I think that, you know, I can appreciate that. I'm not sure everyone is sort of that way. But nonetheless, we try to teach our, our customers about you know, this sort of hacker mentality. The other thing I try to teach is this idea of, you know, how to develop capabilities over time. And, and a lot of times I give the analogy of, like, soccer or football. And football tends to be a pretty good analogy of, you know, so I used to coach soccer in my thinner and, you know, younger days, if you will. And so the things we teach our players are things like, you know, learning your core skills, learning what to do in certain situations, and there's a lot of parallels to cybersecurity, right? So if you're playing soccer, playing football, and you're on a 1v1 situation, where you have the ball, you know, you have a choice to make, right? So you can punch it away, right, which is sort of a, a choice a lot of kids make, or you can be brave enough to try a feint, right? You can try like a Maradona, or you can try some sort of sweep, and you can try to get around the defender, fake them out. And what we'd always tell, you know, the kids and say, you know, if you try it, you're going to learn something, even if you fail. You might say, oh, I tried to do this, but I didn't read the defender correctly, or I tried to do this, or I didn't you know, have the right foot skills in that moment, or I tried to do this. I said, the more more things you try, the better you're going to be at actually accomplishing the goal that you want to accomplish. And this is one of the tougher things that we try to work with our customers with, which is the idea of we try to stop the stigmatization of failure, right? Failure in cyber is not a terrible thing. You don't learn anything from succeeding all the time. You're only going to learn how to get better as a cyber defender by failing at cyber defense, right? By actually seeing intrusions in your environment, seeing how those actors made their way into your environment, and being able to pivot off of that in order to create additional capabilities in your in in your in your uh, in your world, right? So we spent time working with customers on this capability development. That also includes the ability to create uh, curriculums for the different. Um, 
engineers in their organization how they can acquire their cyber capabilities. So for us, a lot of it is how do we take instrumentation, instrumentation and control engineers or nuclear engineers and make them more cyber savvy? Because it turns out it's a little bit easier to teach uh, a nuclear engineer cyber than it is to teach a cyber engineer nuclear engineering, if you will. So that was one of our, and our, so our fifth rule and the fifth final rule, which was choose your team carefully and build together as often as possible, right? And so uh, we had a little talk right before uh, I started talking here about, you know, onboarding new team members, especially to international engagements. And there's a lot of sort of nuance when it comes to working with our international partners, uh, certainly cultural nuance to understanding how to interact with different cultures, certainly being able to listen very, very carefully to understand exactly what they're trying to convey to you and not misreading different signals that you might be acquiring. And so the, the one example, the, from the, maybe the best example I'll give of this was uh, at US PACOM, which is in Hawaii. Um, so essentially, US PACOM manages uh, uh, Japan and Korea uh, network connections, if you will, for classified information exchange, all right? So in the room, Japanese officers, American officers, Korean officers, American officer says, hey, I have a good idea. Let's build out a secure email platform for us all to use, right? And he looks over to the Japanese officers, and they're like, looks over to the Korean officers, and they're like, and he's like, oh, cool, so we can start, right? And so they go build out this thing, and three months later, the Japanese and Koreans are like, why would you do that? We didn't want that. Because he simply just misread their politeness of saying, oh, okay, like, thank you for your idea as a actual, oh, we should move forward and do this. And so there really is a lot of nuance working with our international partners to figuring out, you know, what do they really mean by their hand gestures and their signals and, and then the words they say. And so finally, uh, this past September, I ran a big technical meeting at the IAEA, and the technical meeting was on uh, conducting uh, how to create exercise scenarios for nuclear facilities for cyber attacks, right? And so um, I think probably most of you are familiar with the cyber attack lifecycle, the cyber kill chain. Uh, the Office of Defense National Intelligence in the U.S. produced last year something called the ODNI Cyber Threat Framework. So essentially, they took the seven stages and made them four, which for my international customers was life-saving, right? Because seven stages was a lot to consume. Four was much more approachable for them. So we, I ended up structuring this entire technical meeting around this ODNI framework. And from here, so this is a sort of a view of what a the representative looked like. So there was um, 70 representatives from, I think about like you know, 20 or so different countries brought them all together, and then uh, essentially the first two days were just panels of people presenting their uh, exercise development capabilities. The first panel, which I did on purpose, which was uh, US, Russia, and China, uh, to see how they would get along, and then the rest of the week was all the other experts. So as you can see, the, the Swedish guy is the tallest guy in the front, who is even taller than me, standing a step below me. So very, very tall guy. I always forget to wear my suit pants on picture day, so I don't look like I'm like the guy who walked off the street. But nonetheless, here we are. So I probably look exactly the same today. <laughs> right? All right. So here were the uh, scenario development team. So this is something that was sort of an interesting uh, challenge, right? We wanted to be able to break up the different countries by both, uh, you know, geographic. Um, so we wanted, to, we wanted to have some geographic similarities, right? Because one of the things we're always telling our customers is, you know, you have lots of friends in the community who will help you if you simply ask. All you have to do is find them and ask them and they'll, they'll help you out. So we try to separate here by a bit geographic uh, congruence as well as being able to separate by what, what capabilities we know that the person attending had, if you will. So uh, since we're in Canada, you'll see there's two actually Canadians represented here. Uh, Eric, who works for the nuclear uh, regulator here in Canada, and Luke Danderan, who's a Canadian military guy who uh, worked for NATO for many years and now works for Guard Time. So uh, Luke ended up leading up the sensitive information breach scenario, Eric was the sabotage scenario, uh, removal of material, which is a big deal in our world, uh, removal of nuclear material was Samo from Slovenia, and then uh, Christian, uh, he is a French um, nuclear expert, and his actual specialty is on transportation security for nuclear material, and so they were responsible for essentially taking um, taking this particular ODNI framework and then creating a scenario around these concepts, which was pretty cool. And so what we had them do is we had them create a red scenario, a blue scenario, and then the sort of like a godlike scenario, where you could say, this is what the red team uh, did, and this is what they 
uh, were able to accomplish. This is what the blue team did, this is what they were able to accomplish, and this is what the, the God view was, what they both sort of missed out on. So it was a really nice opportunity to do the no, rule number five, which is create things together. And it was, it was far more successful than I, I perhaps appreciated that it would be, especially in both creating relationships between these different nuclear nation states, as well as, as sort of seeing some pretty cool nuclear scenarios come into play. And so I think with that, I think like, like maybe a minute or two left, right? That was, I guess, pretty good timing. Thank you.